at least my impression was when I was asked to do this that I might give some kind of historical look at it because I have written a book once uh, ages ago, uh, the California Idea in American Higher Ed, uh, which uh, did a you know I'm trained as an historian, so I this is my first book, and I uh, did a pretty lengthy archival research on it and. Uh, at first, I was going to just do a, kind of an historical story of the master plan itself, but then I realized there's a longer story to it. And that's partly what I'm going to discuss today. And then I have a few things that relate to more contemporary issues and things that are going on with the governor and all that. But I'm, as I was just saying to a few of my colleagues here, I'm not in the groove as I used to be about what's going on in California and all the issues uh, but uh, I'm decently versed, so let's see if we can have a discussion at the end. I have a few questions for the group to think about, like, well, how could the California's higher ed system modify it or reform itself in various ways? And so open discussion on that, that's the concept. So I hope you'll kind of keep that in mind. So, you know, I just to be rudimentary, because again, I wasn't, you know, I know that most of the Gardner Fellows have some significant California experience, uh, but you know, sometimes people are from out of state. Also, I always thought oh, it's so really great to see how many, and I don't remember, there were a number of uh, the Gardner Fellows that I believe were transfer students at one time, which is a great California story, you know, which is just not replicated, you know, maybe Texas a little bit in a few places, but California has a very unique story. So in any case, you know, there's general things. There's a universe, there's a three tripartite public system. UC with 10 campuses now, uh, CSU with 23, and the community colleges have 116, and they have all of these centers and all these other kinds of things that are going on. UC, for example, has a very vast, um, you know, uh, stewardship of various reserves of land, and they relate sometimes to the campuses and where they were when they were, you know, like, you know, Riverside was a citrus uh, research station. So there's those, there's significant number of of independence, but relatively small when you compare it to the dominance of the private sector or near dominance in the West Coast, uh, I'm sorry, the East Coast. And then there's this private, for private sector, which is, you know, the University of Phoenix is one of the most well known, but that that's actually shrunk. Their enrollments have gone down, they've had financial issues, and there's lots of stories related to the for profits. But uh, again, just to make sure we're kind of, you know, some knowledge. Uh, you can see uh, the enrollment numbers you, that the University of California has compared to uh, the uh, California Community Colleges. And the thing to remember that these are FTE, full-time equivalents. So we have a large number of, of um, uh, part-time students, particularly in the community colleges, but also CSU, not so much in UC, hardly any, and at the undergraduate level. And that may, really makes a huge difference in terms of the actual numbers, because uh, the enrollment headcount at the community college is a little off, but it's something like 1.8 million. So this tells you something about the differences between the, of the various institutions. Um, uh, then another part is just, you know, tuition and fees are, are quite significantly different. And I would argue that the UC fees of 13K are extremely moderate uh, relative to many other uh, selective public universities, never mind the privates. And then if you unpack that, about half the students in the undergraduate level at, at UC pay no tuition. They're, sub, they're given grants, scholarships. And um, so there's a whole other story related to that in socioeconomic mobility. I won't get into that too much. <laughs> this is kind of complicated, but I'm just gonna say a couple of things. You know, this my numbers might be slightly off because what happened was of course, uh, before the pandemic, and then we've had, and we continue to have a decline in enrollment demand at the community college level is, uh, uh, in particular. So the numbers are, might be a little off slightly, but the important point I want you to understand is, is about 85% of all students in California are going to a public university or college of some sort. So that's really a significant element. And within that, uh, UC takes about, I've, I get my numbers a little off, 8%, 7% of that total go to UC, about 25 plus percent go to community college, I mean, go to CSU and the rest go to, to uh, community colleges. And that's the bulk of where students are going, community colleges. And that's much more exaggerated than uh, the rest of the country. 
And this is an issue that Saul Geyser has talked about and I have as well as an imbalance uh, in that. But we won't get there. <laughs> what I want you to kind of see is that uh, um, uh, there's, and some of these numbers I think are a little off, like the type of school, uh, four-year versus two-year, I think that must be FTE numbers because as I just said, um, you know, uh, uh, two-year may be up to 70 plus percent uh, of the total. So anyway, there's some numbers a little off, but it gives you a sense of one. Another thing to look at is the, uh, the number of getting Pell Grants, 37%. This is the entire system, okay? Uh, public and private. I think it doesn't include uh, uh, for-profits, must not. So let's just give you a few kind of ideas of the demography of the group. Race is also important. And yes, you know, there are absolutely um, some challenges for the most selective institutions, the UCs, in underrepresented minority enrollment, and in particular, Latina X, Latinx, excuse me. And uh, that's really the glaring area of disparity. Uh, but the system as a whole is actually relatively reflective of high school graduates. And this, is, this has been a note of confusion historically. When the system says, what are our goals? for reaching, you know, some form of equity uh, in terms of enrollment. You know, a lot of people digress and say, oh, well, it's the general population, but that's not what the statute and laws have said. It's been about the high school graduates and then the high school graduates that then take the uh, A through G requirements, now A through G. So there's a lot, I'll, I can talk a little more about that, but there's some kind of idiosyncrasies and misinterpretation of uh, of this, what I call, and I've written in another book, the parity model, uh, this concept of uh, demographics and you know, reflecting enrollment at the undergraduate level, graduate level, and faculty, and all these kinds of issues. So this is a, a, a rich area of debate and discussion. So, um, so let me tell you about the 1960 master plan. So there is this kind of concept that I have been battling <laughs> A long time through an actual book that has actual, you know, uh, archival research <laughs> that the master plan somehow invented California's tripartite network of universities in terms of its mission and their goals and, and uh, admissions and things like that. And that is some kind of a biblical event. And it's written by this all the time. And that is just not going to be the case. And I'll show you how or why. Um, and that Clark Kerr single-handedly invented this in his head and pushed it through through a political process that then created this incredible system, which is really is with many flaws. It is seen internationally, worldwide, globally. I give talks in Brazil, in South Korea, in Japan about the system over time I have, but uh, it's really a focus of a lot of international attention, largely because of the uh, mission differentiation that's been so significant, and there's there's reasons for this in the system structure and all that. But um, so yes, Clark Kerr is a marvelous, incredible leader. But it wasn't just his work. There was a master plan survey committee and a whole political process, and uh, some there was negotiating with different players. And Clark Kerr was a major player, but not the only player. So in any case, it didn't give birth to the system. Uh, and, you know, the other thing that's often said is the master plan was the first time that a state in the in California specifically had said that, you know, the uh, post-secondary education in some form is open to all. And um, that's not true either. California made that commitment much earlier. There are problems in the structure of it, but I'll give you some numbers and you'll see. So, um, you know, when it was passed, it got national acclaim. Clark Kerr was on the cover of uh, Time magazine. It doesn't mean so much anymore, but at one time it really did mean a lot. <laughs> Major figures and not just pop stars uh, uh, appeared on Time magazine's cover. And this was a major, you know, major publication for readership. Many things discuss California's uh, structure and it had this influence. And I'm noting one thing because it does relate to our center is that uh, Lord Robbins uh, in the UK came to uh, Berkeley and to our center uh, uh, that existed at that time, which you know goes back to 1950. Well, technically 1956, but established by the Regents in 1957. Um, uh, to look at the system and the community colleges in, in general, which then led to 
the actual development of what's called the um, uh, uh, further education sector in uh, in the UK. So just noting the influence of this. So now let me give you a couple of the themes, some of the themes in the California idea that kind of also changes that the narrative of uh, the divine biblical event. One is it's important to understand that a lot of the much significant structuring of California's higher ed system reflects or was influenced by the University of California's unusual uh, granting of status as a constitutional uh, provision as a public trust. This is this word and you know it has a legal meaning and depends on where you are, but highly autonomous institution. And that happened in 1879. And there's a whole story related to that, which I have written on the politics behind uh, how that happened. Um, so this really created uh, what I would call, I had called a fourth branch of government. Uh, uh, there's structural issues, and I think you're all kind of aware of it, that the Board of Regents acts as a conduit between the larger public and, and, uh, and the, the academy and all of that. And there's a whole series of things we could chat about. But the important thing to understand is, as a result, the state legislature could not pass law, for example, uh, that would uh, uh, that would have binding uh, power to alter the curriculum, like, you know, and the kind of things you're seeing in Florida, you know, the political pressure by governor maybe should do something, but there's, there's constitutional legal frameworks in which that can't happen in California. But for example, you, the, the legislature can't create a campus of the University of California or, so there's a whole series of things that created this, unique kind of entity that was the University of California. And that really also meant that the legislature couldn't influence it directly in a way. So I digress too much on that, but this is a theme that's very important down the road, uh, including the development of the tripartite structure. So California developed, you know, really the first coherent approach to creating a mass higher ed system of any state and probably any country. Well, it is any country really. Um, and part of that pathway was the University of California wasn't the only one, but was a major player in generating the concept of the junior college, now the community college, it was called the junior college. Um, and Berkeley faculty uh, and the dean of the School of Ed were, and the president were big promoters of the concept of creating community colleges as extensions of high schools to provide secondary education that then would relieve some of the pressure of a growing state. California was growing in leaps and bounds, particularly in the Los Angeles area and uh, in the, around the turn of the century. So uh, the concept of the AA degree, which is now a worldwide phenomenon in some places beyond the United States, like Japan, um, was invented on the Berkeley campus as a set of criteria and courses that would allow a student to transfer to Berkeley and eventually to the system as it, as it grew. So this is a major innovation. There are a lot of politics related to it, you know, self-interest of UC, but also a larger conceptual idea of mass higher ed. And to know, let, let you know, through most of the 20th century, well, into the 50s, um, faculty at UC accredited junior, junior highs, I mean, ju uh, junior college, community colleges, and high schools. So there was this linkage of the system. First to state to establish, therefore, matriculation agreements, really beginning in 1910, because that's the first community college that is established in California. And so California is creating this network almost two a year going up into the 1960s uh, community college in each in each area. And, you know, the University of California also became the first multi-campus system in the world, um, in the United States, I should say, although th there's a few examples internationally, like University College London, uh, which are microcosms compared to, <laughs> to what became UC. But UCLA was a teacher's college and then was absorbed and created uh, uh, the second campus with lots of fighting and binding because the Berkeley faculty and uh, alumni didn't want another UC campus to take money away from them from the state that was starting to flow. So, uh, um, but that's a very, also an important distinction because what happens is this multi-campus system becomes a system of likeness and early on a development of a structure likeness. What I mean is each campus eventually has the same mission. They don't have differentiated missions. And that doesn't exist very often in the US. SUNY, uh, CUNY, uh, 
you know, Michigan, others, they're structured differently. They have different institutions under an umbrella. So, um, and then, so what I want you to understand is this tripartite structure and the conceptual idea is really an invention of the progressive era. And there's lots of light and darkness to the progressive era, <laughs> but uh, uh, it really was an incredible innovation and no other state or nation had really conceptually moved in this way, a structural way with funding and statutory law uh, to make that happen. So how can I give you an example of how this, what it meant? So what it meant was that, as I said, by 1910, the first, the legislation was passed in 1905, uh, 1907. And even before that, the University of California Berkeley faculty were promoting this concept so much that they decided to adopt the concept of upper division and lower division courses. Now this had been experimented at in Michigan and various in very small ways, but you see structurally created this and why? So that there was a pathway for transfer to the junior year um, if they took the courses that were required and got this AA degree. So this is you know the common structure today with aberrations and <laughs> challenges and differences. But so this is just gives you a little concept of, of how much growth there was in enrollment uh, by the junior colleges and that they become this dominant uh, uh, pathway. And the, the only other thing important to understand is the community colleges or the junior colleges were not just about transfer. They're also about vocational ed, adult ed. You know, they were partly concept, conceived as a way to help integrate immigrants into society. This, you know, for good or bad, this Americanization con concept, uh, language, other kinds of things. So um, they've always had multiple roles, which is sometimes a, a challenge. Uh, institutions that have so many kind of roles and they have limited resources and all that and are, you know, they're no longer high extensions to high school. They have their own districts. And that happened in 19, about 1921, I guess it is or roughly. So, so this shows you at least that concept. And then over time, you can see where the bulk of, it, of, of enrollment is going, is going to the community college. Now you might ask, oh, well, this, and there is this issue. And I know one of our fellows is looking at the cooling out, which is a uh, uh, Burton Clark's concept uh, that he wrote a book about that, you know, people want to transfer, they go to community college, they want to transfer, and then all these barriers and they don't. And there's a lot of com complexity to that story, that's for sure. But there is a sense of real, uh, uh, you know, that this actually had a positive effect on socioeconomic mobility. And I other thing I want you to understand, because I don't, I don't know if people kind of understand California's demograph demography over time, which is a little hard to track because census records have real problems in undercounting of, uh, you know, uh, Latin, uh, Latino and other populations over time. But, you know, mostly after around 1900 and before, you know, around 90% of the population are white. Okay. And there are significant populations of different minority groups. And it's again, a little hard to track. But by 1960, it hasn't changed that that much. Uh, you're having World War II is bringing in more African Americans, and they rise from about two to seven percent of the population, and they're still they're actually shrinking as a percentage. So anyway, complexities to demography, and then there's huge change after 1970, and it's already happening in the 60s. But federal government changes policy on immigration, and there's a huge change throughout the nation in the population and demography. So. And we, the data is always a little hard to figure out on some of this, but that's generally the you know my what I'm painting is in, in the ballpark. <laughs> so this chart at least tells you how successful the transfer rate. This is for Berkeley and UCLA, and of course you see this huge growth during World War II, the post World War II period, um, uh, and that's you know uh, the coming back on the GI Bill, the University of California grows dramatically, and other other institutions throughout the country do, but you can see how robust um, the transfer rates uh, are uh, through it. And they're, you know, they're getting up to 40% in the post-World War II period, something 48, 45% at Berkeley and UCLA transfer students uh, there. So um, uh, as opposed to now, it's around 28%, uh, roughly our goal is to be at 33. So this is an issue, uh, what's going on with the transfer side. So, <clears throat> A couple of things related to 
what led up to the master plan. I'm trying to look at my clock to make sure I, we have time for some discussion. Um, I just want you to understand there were other planning reports that the master plan absorbed aspects of these over time. And there was a major effort to create greater coordination and planning after World War II. You know, there was great concern that there would be this huge return of GIs, that the Depression era, recession level uh, economy would return to, throughout the nation. Um, and uh, a higher education, the GI Bill was about uh, education and uh, uh, training uh, people for the labor force, but it was also to give them something to do. <laughs> uh, so to absorb all these returning veterans. Now, the economy did much better in the post-World War II period than they were thinking. You know, there was a real concern of, of a return to Depression era uh, economics. But that's another story. So uh, in 1945, the first kind of uh, official uh, coordinating agency, not statutory, just an agreement between the UC Regents and the California State Board of Education uh, uh, did this. And I should have noticed that both the community colleges and, well, they were still called junior college and the state colleges, what became CSU, were under the State Board of Ed. Um, the 1948 Stray Report uh, rejected a proposal or said it was not a good idea, even though there was discussion of extending the BA to some or selective community colleges. They said this would ruin the concept of the community college and that there were other pathways for growth, uh, looking at huge enrollment growth. California is now on the path to be the largest state in the union by 1963. And the, you know, the, the numbers are clear. This growth is a constant pressure and that's a constant aspect of planning in California higher ed. Now we're entering a little bit of a different period, but long-term probably still growth. Um, and created uh, that that report created uh, uh, Long Beach, LA, and Sac State. Um, and then the 1955 restudy report, which I won't get in too much. Why is it called restudy? Because it's a restudy of the 1948 report, Stray report. <laughs> and I have to say, I do have a little bit of a family link there because my uh, grandfather was the head of the state colleges at that time and uh, was a co-author on the Stray, Stray Report. So and, and uh, so it was the restudy because it was restudying the enrollment projections and grouping for, uh, for higher ed. And then in 1957, as part of that outgrowth of the restudy, most of the campuses that were agreed in the 1960s were identified and outlined as an agreement between the board State Board of Education and uh, the Regents in 1957, that then that becomes part of the master plan. So what did the master plan not do is the way <laughs> to say, it. then I'll get to what it did do. It's not the single creation of Clark Kerr, obviously, did not create the tripartite system, did not uh, expand California's commitment to mass higher ed. What it did is redistribute it and try to create a plan that was economically feasible for that law lawmakers and Governor Pat Brown at that time felt that, you know, this we needed some kind of a plan because it was very a lot of frenzy going on, a new campus development, a statutory law passed that would just create a campus and Stanislaus, uh, which at one point was called Tricky U, but <laughs> in the press, uh, because they would go, why are they putting a, a state college campus in Stanislaus with no population at that time? So those are old stories that's all gone. But uh one of the things that it did do uh, was it, it actually increased the uh, uh, admissions requirements to go to UC and what it became CSU. So it redirected around, I, I'm forgetting now, what is it, 200,000 students over time, it was a projection, to the community colleges. And it raised UC's admissions pool, which had established, and it raised, basically had done this for since the 1920s, roughly, and I have done research on this, it was around 15% of the top high school graduates and it reduced it down to 12.3. And then uh, the community, the state colleges were all over the place, but they thought they were on average about 43% and it brought it down to 33.3. The concept that the, the missions requirements would match those students in high school, the, those that eligibility pool and UC and, C, and the state colleges worked together on, on the criteria for courses and these kinds of things. And, what is now the A through J, the A through G requirements. 
So they actually push all these students to community college. And why? Because it saved money and it created a structure for a larger commitment of state money to create new campuses uh, and these kinds of things. And it's very important to understand that while they valued the no tuition system, students were paying fees. It didn't say in perpetuity that there would be no tuition. Some people make this claim. Their master plan said there would be never be tuition, and that's just not the case. They knew the plan was to 1975, so <laughs> and they knew it couldn't last forever. So, um, so what did it do? Well, there were around 60 recommendations in that report itself, which is a document of joint jointly approved by the regents and the uh, and the uh, state board of education, and. Uh, uh, it's the result of what they call the master plan survey team. And there's a lot of politics related to that, but the, the lead of that was Arthur Coons, who was then the president of Oxford, of Occidental, excuse me, Occidental College down in Southern California. And he was seen as a neutral arbitrator, arbiter, um, arbitrator. Uh, so, um, so there was tremendous pressure, just I want you to understand is in the late fifties, there was no concrete plan a legislator could simply come up and say, I want a campus in my district. And if he could get the politics lined up in the California legislature, he, had, he could pass it. So there was just, and why? Because it's like funneling state money to a local district, uh, creating jobs and, and educational opportunity, absolutely. But there was just out of control. And so a number of legislators, include, and Pat Brown, who was elected in 1958, said, we have to have a plan. And if we don't have a plan here, we're going to reorganize California higher education, likely under a super board, which was a real conflict, like the Board of Regents versus the State Board. And there was just like, you know, the concept of UC absorbing or the board, the Regents, which would have been a reconstituted absorbing all these state colleges with different ethos about research and what they're doing would have, you know, just been, it would have tanked CUC as what it is today and altered the system significantly. But anyway, they threatened that without a concrete plan. But the important thing I want to note is, unlike a lot of legislators who think they're going to have master plan review committees and create some great innovation in master plan, which has been almost zero impact or very little impact on the system as a whole in terms of reform, there's a few things happening now that I would say are out of that, but they looked at the segment and said, you guys got to come up with this plan. You know, the, 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 the state, the board of regents and the state board, and then the leadership with Clark Kerr. And then uh, Glenn Dumkey was the leadership who, uh, for uh, the CSU. And he was then the president of San Francisco state. Um, so uh, this negotiating, you know, was partly about avoiding and creating uh, some coherency into moving forward as to how the state of California would grow its system of higher ed. So it's really actually more important for what it preserved and prevented than what it created. Um, and, you know, I want to note something because it's so important in our modern world is there's no mention of race or ethnicity in promoting socioeconomic mobility in 1960. And there are a lot of reasons, I think, for that. I mean, it's conjecture. Uh, but I think it's probably because everything was couched in the context of socioeconomic mobility being being economic, low-income students, these kinds of things. And the structure was such that, like, in admissions, you know, you really didn't know the ethnicity of anybody who was applying as long as they had the A through G. And if you were had that A through G in that era, it's not like today, you would get into Berkeley or you would get, you know, it's just they were room, there were funding for it and enrollment growth. So that's how that world has obviously changed, but it's just an interesting aspect to, uh, to understand. I'm not going to get through this uh, through, I just wanted, this is from the book and I have, you know, and we have had a master plan website as well as showing various historical documents, but uh, the bankrupt seems to have put it into some kind of um, other world uh, non-accessed uh, website. I don't know why, but in any case, uh, the other thing to note is it created a coordinating council that replaced the liaison committee as a formal statutory entity um, that lasted and then was reformed in 1974 as the California Post-Secondary Education Commission, which was then disbanded by Jerry Brown for cost reasons and other reasons. Uh, as I noted, there was this, I think I noted that uh, the, the state colleges, what became CSU, um, were put on under uh, uh, its own board of trustees out of the state board of education. There was lots of 
uh, debate and argument that the state board couldn't pay attention or didn't pay attention enough to, to the development of the of the state colleges, which are largely regional in their service area. That's changed some with you know Cal Poly Pomona and and San Diego State uh, is you know really drawing off throughout the state, but they still have a strong regional uh, focus, and that had to be done by constitution. Just so you know, at that time the argument was by the state college folks and Glenn Dumpy, Dumpke and others, we need to have status like UC as a constitutionally assured public trust so that we could run our shop. And the lawmakers said, no way. <laughs> We're not gonna create another UC that we can't control and tell what to do. So that did not, that did not happen. Um, the, the, the rest, the Donahoe Act itself is largely mission differentiation. It doesn't, it says kind of a, you know, UC being the doctoral education and research entity, these kinds of things. Um, and um, uh, <clears throat> other things are not in statute. So, for example, which I, I think is finally maybe some people are understanding, the admissions pools that we all know, it's, it's not even in statute. Uh, unless something's bled in in the last three years that I don't know about. Um, <laughs> it isn't sacrosanct. It's a it's a concept. And just so you know, recent studies actually show that UC is accepting around 15% of the pool. And uh, I think CSU is up in uh, like, you know, uh, 37 or eight or something. I heard a number recently. There's always these studies, which Saul Geyser knows about as to what the eligibility pool and what they're drawing from. And that's who you draw from and isn't who shows up. So that's a different number. Um, increased funding for community colleges to help, help them grow, to meet that enrollment. Um, growth that was going to happen, and then also pushing more students to the community colleges, uh, tuition-free, not in statute, a statement of, of, of desire, but not forever. They tried to go to a proposed uh, full-year calendar. That's an old debate and discussion. And then money for new campuses, which were basically outlined in the 1957 uh, campus study that I noted before. So a couple of slides related to, well, what is, you know, what success, what did it mean? And one thing that's interesting is that the 19th, it was supposed to go through 1975 and they severely under, under uh, projected uh, the growth of the community college. This is if you see that left um, grayish uh, a bar and you can just see the tremendous growth in the community colleges. And uh, again, this is an issue Saul has talked about and I have over time. And that is the master plans concept was maybe 50, percent or so of of uh of um all public higher ed enrollment would come at the community colleges and then there are difficulties again as i said between fte full-time equivalent people you know course load equaling one person versus headcount so there's some noise related to that uh but you know now we're at about 70 75 percent of students in the in the public system are in uh community colleges so it's it's a uh, you know, and there are re a lot of reasons for that. Um, uh, it is about demand to some degree, but in, in any case, then as you probably at least have a sense, <laughs> this tremendous growth that you see, this the, the the master plan created an agreement that at least in an initial period allowed for the with capital funding to as well as operating budget to grow the system, and this just shows the campuses as they're created. Over time, these are general campuses uh, of the UC system, the third being Santa Barbara in 1944. That's a whole interesting political story. But then another thing I just want to note to you that, that is uh, important because uh, the University of California has a relatively low percentage for a research intensive public university uh, has a relatively low number percentage of graduate students. And this is also an ongoing planning issue related to labor market needs, but also the economic engine that is UC and with this new TA unionization, there's a lot of issues going on there. So what has happened since 1960? Well, there are a lot of things, uh, uh, but one is I noted to you before, Jerry Brown uh, dissolved CPAC. There is no equivalent to CPAC. There's nothing in statute. At the moment, the governor has his own council on head, higher ed, and he's shifting it because it relates to his larger agenda on career education. And I'll just say something briefly on that, uh, another slide. Um, 
The other thing is that selectively, the community college have been allowed to grant the BA uh, in certain specific fields. And the ongoing concept is, and UC used to fight these things like tooth and nail, uh, but the world has changed. Demand uh, for BAs is higher, uh, but the conceptual idea still is, although nobody's there to regulate it, that's what CPEC did, that you're not creating redundant programs that aren't needed in the in the economy or for socioeconomic mobility. And that's an interesting tension there. Uh, when are we creating programs that really meet a need and don't interfere with existing programs already being subsidized by the state in either CSU or UC? So, but this new one that does seem like a big need to me, but I is nursing, but nursing is expensive too. So CSU might have better capacity to grow in nursing, but I'm not up on all that kind of stuff. So legislation allowing CSU to grant the doctorate. One thing I, I may have had it in that chart before, one of the uh, one of the compromises, the master plan in 1960, because it was this push to offer the doctorate and have research funding at, at the state colleges, which you see successfully battled against because they saw it as draining funds away from UC and also creating programs that may not have the quality that one might expect, um, was this joint doctorate. They could offer a joint doctorate. It was so, so, you know, there have been joint doctorates with like Long Beach and I don't know, I think Claremont Graduate School and a few others with UC. They're all small, they're boutique, they've never been significant. CSU has been working hard and has pushed legislation, uh, which could be done by statutory law, um, uh, to grant doctoral education in specific applied fields. So initially, audiology, a few of these areas that UC has really dropped, which I think is a shame, actually. UC has become a little too elite in its mindset sometimes uh, regarding professional education. Um, but as you can see in the next slide, just recently, uh, I think it was this summer, uh, legislation was passed that allowed the Board of Trustees to decide which campuses or programs could be offered a doctorate. So there's this is the camel's nose in the under the tent, as they used to say. So, but another big area is this concern about transfer students. And I will say that you know CSU has done more to kind of help uh, deal with the complications now, the modern complications of transfer, which didn't exist 50 years ago in the same way it's just you know like berkeley used to accept any student that took x degree program you know um courses and uh, uh got a you know a b uh and they would get into berkeley and they you know still the lower the threshold is lower at the transfer rate to get into into any uc but berkeley for example uh, but there's been a lot of difficulties and challenges and so they've created this associate degree for transfer between the usc csu and uc the community colleges to help kind of align courses that they're taking that then go into the major. Anyway, it's a complicated story, but um, it, it appears to be making a, a difference. You see still, as I said before, we're about 28%. Our goal is to have 33% of all undergraduate speed transfer students. But uh, so there's work to be done there, that's for sure. And recently, I won't get into it, there's a lot of push externally by the governor and there has been in the past for UC to offer online degree programs and this academic senate has been fighting about there's a current battle going on uh, about well we need to have students have residency experience and this is all post COVID so um, just to give you a couple of trend lines and then the conclusion is that yes here's an issue going on here one is you know obviously there's the transition of COVID and the pandemic and what that has meant uh, in terms of uh, educational attainment and access rates. But we also have California has a, you know, is looking at the decline in the number of high school graduates for the like, we're, this is the first time uh, in the history, it just feels constant growth. But I want you to take that with a grain of salt because this is Department of, of Finance numbers. They're, they're supposed to give these projections and they're notoriously wrong. <laughs> they're always underestimating. And so there could be a lot of variations that will come on. And this, this curve does relate to COVID. And the biggest impact on California public higher education was at the community college level. Um, huge decline or significant decline. So there's some real issues. But the one thing I want you to understand is while we are kind of like, you know, immigration policy is always a big variable in population growth. The other thing, and this is the good news, is that uh, high school graduation rates 
and uh, population, particularly uh, Latinx, getting uh, the A through G requirements is going up significantly. You know, we're, we're what we're saying. There's a lot of reasons for that. Some of it's investment in high schools and and better investment because we used to be in the bottom ten states in funding per student at the elementary school level and all that about 20 years ago, major reinvestment that has occurred over time. And uh, um, just, you know, demographic change, you're getting not just immigrant groups, but second generation, third generation uh, growth in the uh, Latinx population is big part of that number. So in any case, that's, there's, there's reasons to think that that growth will continue. And, you know, the other part, well, this is just to give you a concept of, of how big the Latin, uh, Latinx uh, population is in growth. Other is also something that people kind of don't think about, but multiracial kids are the second fastest or largest birth rate uh, number of kids. Um, and it's going to change the demography of the state. And the old lines of four racial, five racial groups is going to blur significantly over time. And this is another area of interesting debate <laughs> over time because it's about political power and other things like that. So um, evaluating the system, relatively high rates of socioeconomic mobility, and UC does really well in that. There are problems, but generally much better than, than other states. Um, moderate access, uh, but low degree production. So this is a huge problem. It, it's getting better. But we have high attrition rates. People get in, but they don't get they don't come out with a degree, or they mean on it. We still don't know have all the data because sometimes they they leave and they go somewhere else. And they you know, and there's so there's issues about uh, collecting data and really know what happens in terms of educational attainment rates. And they, this gets back to still too many students in two year programs. All the data shows you know the chances of you moving on to a BA, whatever reasons, a lot of reasons. If you enter a, a two years program. It's just a lot harder to to go through, and there's we can talk data on that. But uh, so there is some decline in the transfer function, as I said at UC, compared to the '50s um, and before. Um, challenge of underrepresented minorities, particularly and middle class, uh, in the most selective institutions, which is all the UCs, but more so in at certain UCs than others. Um, Decline in the state's commitment for public funding, which you know started to dive in the 1970s over long haul, has gone up and down. 80s, we had a resurgence. Governor Newsom is actually investing quite a bit, so he's changing the dynamics there. But we're in a process of a that's a relatively low but uh, a fee tuition system, high financial aid, and there's a lot of difficulty and challenges and complexity to that. And as I said, declining enrollment demand yet. Uh, there's this question of labor needs over time. Um, you know, the uh, governor has a compact with UC and CSU. He calls it the compact. It kind of excludes the legislature. The legislature used to be a real power broker and things and has become less and less so over the decades. So it's really this negotiation between the governor. Um, he's really focused on career education and getting the community colleges and the CSU and UC to some degree aligned more in trying to understand what labor needs are. Now, let me tell you, estimating labor needs in out, out years is a very challenging <laughs> thing. And there's a lot of problems with trying to guess what the labor market is. And so the one concept is you let mark, you know, you let students kind of decide where they want to go. Yes, you try to build up nursing and all that, but you don't try to do this like a centralized planning structure. Um, anyway, that's a whole nother uh, issue. But one thing that has come out in this, in this concept, well, we need a million BAs uh, to meet future labor needs. And the public PPIC, the Public Policy Institute of California has been doing this analysis for some times and saying that we need this for this labor need. So we have this, you know, this decline in population and and uh, other issues. And yet this concept that the labor market is going to be Necessarily, there's the long-term projection is California is going to grow by another like five million or something in ten years. So, who knows? Right? This is, con uh, but the other goal is seventy percent of all California residents having a higher ed degree or credential, and cur currently it's forty percent. And you know, boy, there's a lot of reasons for that. 
and it can improve, but it's a real challenge because you've got a large immigrant population, first generation, all of those things that need to be addressed, but it adds to a lot of complexity. So these are some other elements of the compact. I know I've got to, you know, I've really just gone through this. So a few final thoughts. Uh, um, you know, the, again, the public trust aspect of the UC system has really shaped uh, so much the politics uh, of shaping the system. UC was a dominant player in that, mostly for good, but sometimes for bad. <laughs> um, and the thing I want you to understand is the leadership of governors, governors really, really matter. And all of the as aspects of California's development, and I would say other states as well, Nelson Rockefeller and the development of the uh, uh, SUNY system, the State University of New York, um, governors really, really matter. And Earl Warren, uh, who was the governor of World War II and became uh, chief justice and was the lead, you know, person Brown versus the Board of Education. Pat Brown, uh, uh, George Duke Asian, who was a Republican. Earl Warren was a Republican as well, and a different kind of Republican. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, reinvested, and now Gavin Newsom is really, you know, he's he's put higher ed as a high priority, even with this budget deficit we're reaching. Um, so, and public. Uh, opinion on the value of higher ed and the interaction of the systems with the public and its public engagement are really important. Legislative reviews of higher ed are almost always go nowhere. And there's a reason for that because they don't bring in the players, the segments into the process of reform and innovation largely. So we've had many reviews, legislative reviews. We're going to review the master plan and you know, not a lot comes out of it to do, almost hardly ever. Um, so uh, those are the major things I wanted to say, uh, decline in meaningful coordination, that's for sure. Um, but so with that, I know I probably just burned all this time, but uh, uh, you know, I wanted to ask if there is any uh, opportunity to discussion. You know, I'd like the fellows to tell me what they think are the big problems and challenges for California 